All right, everybody, it is time to get started. Um, hello, my name is Kara Moncrief, and I am the Clinical Communications Director for Sinclair and Viora. Um, today, we are going to be covering our brand new device, which is the Elysian, which is a diode um, laser for hair removal. So super exciting. Um, and I am going to share my screen with you guys. Um, and we're really going to go page by page in the workbook to really get an understanding of the protocols, um, of how the technology works, and um, much, much more. So I will share my screen. Give me one second. Let me find it. Why isn't it? Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna start this from the beginning and do a full screen mode view. Then I'm going to pin my spotlight. Okay, so now we will, I don't know why my, that's so weird, my, um. Ah, there we go. I'm able to move it. My control bar like went in the middle of the screen, which was not going to be easy for me to, to see the workbook. Okay, so now we'll get started. So our Elysian um, hair removal device. First page here, this is the workbook that you would get with your training. And the first page just goes through how to contact us for any questions. You have both the customer care department and the clinical department phone numbers and email addresses. So I just wanted to make a note of that just in case you do have any questions. Um, okay, so our first page, we are going to be discussing uh, light and wavelength. So with um, almost everything that we do within our industry with energy, energy-based devices, it's all part of an EM spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, which is actually going to show a photo of that on the next page. Um, so with lasers, with light-based technologies, it's also part of the electromagnetic spectrum and how we measure the, the, the light and how it's entering into the tissue is by the wavelength, which is measured in nanometers. So with wavelengths, wavelengths also have, um, and, and it's light, sorry, let me back up. What we're using is a light-based technology that then transfers into heat. And light is tiny um, massless particles that are photons traveling in a wave-like manner. So we have wavelengths and with wavelengths, we also have the frequency in which they, they move. So a long wavelength, which is here, this photo here um, that's showing the red color, a long wavelength, the frequency is how many times does a wavelength peak in the matter of a second. So a long wavelength is going to have a very low frequency. So it actually has time to get deeper into the tissue, the way it's traveling, the way it's moving into the skin. So low frequency, it may only peak three times in the matter of a second, where a short wavelength has a very high frequency. So it's peaking many, many times within a second. So really it's staying more superficial in the skin because of the way it's moving. So longer wavelengths, deeper penetration, lower frequency and shorter wavelengths, more superficial penetration in the skin, um, higher frequency. Okay, so when you see the numbers like in nanometers, when you see a higher number, you know it's just able to penetrate deeper. There's one exception to that rule, which we're gonna talk about on the bottom of this page. So here is a photo of the electromagnetic spectrum and um, almost everything in life is part of this EM spectrum, UV, um, the visible light, which is how we perceive color, um, x-rays, our cell phones, our TVs, um, microwaves, almost everything that's around us. And additionally, radio frequency that we use and then laser. So it's all part of the spectrum. And um, with, if you have uh, viewers IPL, that's all in the visible light spectrum. But with the diode laser, we're gonna talk about what wavelengths we are using. It's outside of the visible spectrum. It's a little bit deeper into the infrared spectrum. And with lasers, the shorter the wavelength, the lower the number, the more superficial it's penetrating in the skin. 
So when you hear a number like 415 nanometers, that's very superficial in the skin compared to, let's say 1064 nanometers. There's a big difference in those numbers. Therefore, there's a big difference in how deep it's penetrating into the tissue. There's one exception to that rule, and that is when we're dealing with CO2 or erbium, um, erbium YAG lasers. Reason for this is CO2 and erbium YAG lasers are much longer wavelengths than the 10,000s, and well, the CO2 is. And when you get that long of a wavelength, when you look at the chromophore absorption chart, water is a big chromophore. Chromophore is a light sensitive molecule. It wants to attract that light. So water, the high, I'm sorry, the longer the wavelength, the higher absorption ability. So when you get into this, these really, really high wavelengths or long wavelengths, you get a really high attraction of water. And what does our skin have a lot of? It's water. So as soon as that laser really touches the skin and finds the water, it ablates. So it's actually staying very superficial. Um, there's some controllability on that where you can go a little bit deeper if you want to, but for the most part, it really is staying um, quite superficial comparative to like 1,064 nanometers that's going much deeper in the skin. And that wavelength is an NDAG long pulse laser. And that's used for treating like body vascularity. You need to get deep. It's used for treating hair removal. You need to get deep to get to the root of the hair follicle. Okay. So what is a laser? What does it stand for? So laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. <laughs> it's very long. Um, and really it's, um, it's a light-based technology and a laser is light. And then that light then transfers into heat. And if we can get enough heat, then we get coagulation and necrosis of whatever our target is. Death to the hair follicle or death to pigment, if that's what we're treating. And um, laser technology is based on the principle of selective photothermolysis or pho photothermolysis. There's an, um, different ways of saying that. But what it means, breaking it down, photo meaning light, thermo meaning heat, lysis meaning destruction. So that's what we're doing. Taking a light-based technology, building enough heat where we can get coagulation. The reason why we say selective is because we don't want coagulation and necrosis of everything that that laser is going to touch. When you put it on the skin, we wanna keep the skin safe. We want to kill the hair follicle. So we have the ability of doing that. And that's why it's selective. We're gonna keep them safe, but get rid of that unwanted hair. This is really, really, really important to understand when you're dealing with any type of light-based technology, whether it be laser or IPL, um, and that is TRT, thermal relaxation time. I am gonna be talking about it a little bit today, but I highly recommend if you don't know it very well to really kind of study on your own and get to know it, um, because it really is one of the most important things um, to understand and how we're, destroying, you know, getting coagulation and necrosis of all of these um, unwanted uh, problems that we have, unwanted hair, unwanted acne, unwanted pig pigmented lesions. And it's, it is really based on the pulse duration of the system. So that being said, this page, I like to just bring up how important TRT is, how important it is to understand. But when I get to the page of talking about pulse duration, that's when I'm going to really break it down uh, more so. So I'm going to kind of skip over it right now, and then we'll talk about it in just a couple pages. Um, but I do want to talk about chromophores. So chromophores are light sensitive molecules, and everything that we're targeting needs to be light sensitive, right? Because we're using a light based technology. So the three chromophores that the diode, that the Elysian is attracted to, first one being melanin. So that is how really the main reason how we're able to destroy a hair follicle. It's the pigment in a hair follicle. And that's why we cannot get results on gray hair or blonde hair. It's the lack of pigment in the actual follicle itself. And there's two other chromophores that the diode is attracted to, and that's hemoglobin and water. But that's kind of secondary, really our main chromophore that it's targeted, um, is attracted to, I should say, is melanin. 
So there is, um, you know, a blood source around um, hair follicles. And of course there's water surrounding hair follicles because we have a lot of water in the tissue. So there is a little bit of attraction, but not much, almost kind of don't even think about it because it's really the pigment in the hair that's, that's um, able to give us our results. Okay, so there's four basic components to every laser. Diode's a little bit different. So the next page will break down how, how the diode is different. Um, but just your, your basic um, lasers, and not just in the cosmetic world, all lasers are created this way. Um, but if you want to think of like a CO2 laser or an NDAG um, laser or um, uh, a, a, a ruby um, laser or not Alexandra, I, I could keep going on and on and on. Um, they're all created this way. Okay, so we first have an optical cavity. It's just the cavity that's housing everything. Then we have a lacing medium and the medium can be a solid, it can be a liquid, it could be a gas, it could be a dye. So CO2 is a gas, ruby is a solid. Um, they have pulse dye lasers where they actually put colors, the dye of a color inside there to get a specific wavelength. Then we have a power source. It's the um, electricity that's stimulating the medium inside. And then we have a delivery system, which is the laser output, the beam that comes out of the laser. And additionally, we have two mirrors on both sides of that cavity. One is 100% reflective and one is partially reflective. So what happens is the power source goes off, we, we stimulate, we give power inside, and everything is made of atoms, right? So the medium inside is made of atoms, therefore we have electrons. So when we stimulate the medium, the electrons are really, really excited, and they don't want to be excited. They want to be at a, at a really stable, grounded state, but they have no choice. They get excited, they get stimulated. Then what happens is they want to, and they need to release their energy. And how they do that is they release a photon. And then these mirrors are really for those photons to start because all of this is very excited inside the cavity. And those mirrors are for those photons to bounce back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then the photons start to line up with one another and they start to travel in a wave manner. And it's the wavelength that we want because of the medium that we put inside the cavity. So they start to travel in a wave-like manner and then out comes um, the laser beam. Who thought of this? I, I just, I can't even believe how people's minds work to, to have uh, created a, a laser. It's amazing. So, um, so that's how a typical laser works. Now a diode, pretty much works the same way. It's a little different. Um, an LED, an LED is a diode. It's a light emitting diode. So you probably already, already know about diodes, right? A lot of your light bulbs are probably now using this diode method. Um, and the reason why diodes are so amazing is think of your LED light bulb and think of a traditional light bulb. How often do you have to replace a traditional light bulb? And how often are you gonna to have to replace the LED light bulb? It's gonna be years and 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 years. And I can keep going on and on and on and on because diodes were created to last a long time. So the Elysian was developed to work the, the full life of um, your med spa or your office, that's how hard this Elysian is going to work because it is a diode and it's meant to last. So what is a diode inside? So it's, it's really a, um, a sandwich of two layers of material. It's usually metal alloy. And one slice of that, the top part is called the N-type and it's highly charged with electrons. So think back to what I was just talking about. We need the electrons, therefore we get the photons. And the other at the bottom is called the P-type and that contains holes and the holes attract the electrons. So when the electricity is applied, the power source is applied to it and everything gets excited like it does. The electrons combine with the holes and the excess energy is admitted. Um, and, and that's when we start to form photons. And again, you know what happens is we have two mirrors, same with the diode, two mirrors, and those photons are bouncing back and forth and they start to line up with one another and then out comes um, our, our uh, laser beam. 
So very similar, but also very different. Um, okay, so depending on the materials used for the N type and the P type, that's how you're getting different wavelengths. So you can have a wavelength of, of any number, any type of wavelength that you want, just in a diode just by using different materials inside. Again, who thought of this? It's amazing. Geniuses out there. Um, diode lasers are normally assembled as rods. So there's one little diode and then they're, they're put together and then that forms a rod of several diodes. And then um, they're assembled into stacks and that's what determines the spot size that you're using. Um, and then there's a uh, glass really it's a sapphire crystal. If you guys have our um, Viora IPL, same thing. It's a sapphire crystal and that cooled to keep the patient comfortable, but also keep the skin safe, the epidermis safe. And in the case of Elysian, the wavelengths that are used are 810 nanometers. And then additionally, really that's, that is the wavelength that the Elysian uses. And in the near future, we're going to a blend the combination of 810, 940, and then six nanometers. And that is going to be exceptionally um, great at dark skin hair removal. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit when we get later in, into the workbook. Okay, so quick overview of the Elysian. The max energy fluence is up to 140 joules. Uh, max energy influence, uh, fluence is influenced by the spot size and pulse duration. So we'll talk about those two. I think they're on the next page. Um, and I think this is kind of self-explanatory that the higher the energy, the higher uh, joule that you use, joule is just a measure of energy. So the higher um, number the joule is, then the more aggressive the device is going to be. Um, the lower, the safer it's going to be, and the less aggressive it's going to be. Um, also, when you get higher in your power, you're also able to reach deeper into the tissue. The lower the power, the lower the joules, the more superficial you're going to stay. So don't really think about that when you're doing a treatment like, okay, I need to increase the energy to get deeper into the skin. No, the 810 nanometer wavelength is already a very deep wavelength that's already going to get all the way to the bulb um, of the hair follicle to destroy it, which we'll go through the science of that too. Um, but you, there's truth to it, but don't think about that when you're doing treatment because that could get you into trouble. Like I gotta get deeper and you go higher and then, ah, that's not good. Um, okay, so right now, so there's two spot sizes. Right now we have one, which is the 10 by 18 millimeter. Uh, the 10 by 10 will be coming out um, also in the near future. And um, the 10 by 18, I, I can't tell you how quickly these treatments are, which again, I'll talk about in a few pages, um, but it really is phenomenal. The spot size is really, really good for doing like a large man's back, a full woman's legs. The full woman's legs takes 10 to 12 minutes. A full man's back takes eight to 10 minutes. It's incredible um, because we have a really good spot size. It's also a great spot size for uh, the philtrum, you know, the, the, when we get hair above the lip for women, um, don't think it's too large to do that area. It's not at all. The small will be, you know, convenient for smaller areas. The, the large fits really well. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Bigger the spot size, the deeper the penetration, you have just more surface area to cover and, it, and the spot size actually goes deeper. The smaller the spot size, the more superficial you're staying in the skin. Um, and the larger the spot size, the less scatter that you have. So you actually have more energy that's being absorbed into the skin. So you're actually having to use less energy with larger spot sizes. We have some status LED indications on the handpiece that let you know when it's ready, when it's on standby, when there's a problem. So when it's blue, oh gosh, I can barely see that. That's the, the play status. So the device, um, oh gosh, I cannot see that. The device will discharge a pulse. Okay, so blue is just when it's ready to go. Um, green is when it's paused. So a lot of times when you hang up the handpiece, it will go into that standby mode for safety green. So when you pick it up and you go to trigger, 
why isn't it going? It's because you haven't started it yet. And the way to start it is just to hold down the trigger and then you'll see it turn blue and then it's ready to go. Um, and then red is warning of a fault in the device, which I have never seen. <laughs> I don't think that happens rarely ever, maybe. Um, I've never seen it, but it's good that we have that. It's warning you. And then purple, the device is um, still in setup mode prior to use. So when it's calibrating, um, it, it will be purple. Okay, so we have two uh, operation modes with the Elysian. We have the static mode and we have the dynamic mode. Uh, please note, static mode is going to be great for your skin types one, two, and three, and then additionally, sometimes the skin type four, and then the dynamic mode is going to be great for your skin type four through sixes. So for, for skin types, static one through three, sometimes four, dynamic skin types four through six. When you would use dynamic on a lighter skin type is for comfort. So I'll talk about that in just a bit. First, we'll talk about static mode. So the static mode is a modality that it just delivers one single pulse um, with maximum energy and the shortest um, pulse duration allowing for effective treatment. So it's one single pulse with higher energy. So this really, is, if they're a lighter skin type, this is really the mode that you want to choose for that very quick, fast treatment. When you want to get a full woman's legs done in 12 minutes, it's static mode because you can adjust the hertz on static mode. So we have three options, one hertz, two hertz, and three hertz. What, what is a hertz? It is, um, it's the speed in which the system can work pretty much. So one is equal to one second. Two Hertz is two pulses per second and three Hertz is three pulses per second, which the three Hertz is really what you're typically using always for your lighter skin types to really get the treatment done quickly. But there is a use for one Hertz and two Hertz, uh, especially one, one Hertz, that one pulse per second, it's just a stamping technique where you put it down, pulse, overlap by 30%, put it down, pulse, overlap by 30%. That's gonna be great for those harder areas where you're not gonna glide, where it's gonna be like the upper lip for a woman, you're just gonna do a stacked pulse, um, or not stacked pulse, a single pulse overlapping. Maybe like, um, well, we're usually not doing the forehead, but you know, any of those kind of hard to reach areas or smaller areas, that's when you would be using that. And then two hertz and three hertz is really for anywhere else, <laughs> a full man's back, full woman's legs, underarms, oh, bikini, bikini area, you're sometimes using the one hertz because there, it's hard to glide in that area. Maybe some of the area you can glide and then other areas you would just want to use a stamp. So the two hertz and three hertz, this is two or three pulses per second, which is a gliding modality. So all you do is you hold down the trigger and you glide overlapping by 30%. So two hertz, you're going to glide slower to make sure you're really watching and getting that 30% overlap. Sometimes people just try to go too quickly and they're missing a lot of areas. And then three hertz, you're just gliding faster, really watching and getting that 30% overlap. I would say two hertz really isn't used too much unless maybe you're wanting to glide, but glide a little bit slower. Um, one hertz and three hertz are gonna be your most used. Okay, um, so the reason why it's good for your skin types one, two, and three is again, going up to that first bullet point, it's using maximum energy. So it's more aggressive in the way it's delivering that energy where the dynamic mode is, is much different. And I think once I explain it, then it will make sense on why the darker skin types need the dynamic mode. So the dynamic mode, the objective is to accumulate energy in a given area over a certain uh, period of time. So the area is the size of a piece of gauze. So four by four, um, and it's really, really important and, and good practice if you're gonna be treating like a woman's legs to always have a white eyeliner pencil and mark out the size of a, of a traditional um, four by four piece of gauze and then just follow that pattern throughout the, the legs. Um, otherwise, when you're doing this, sometimes you end up trying to do too large of an area and you're not accumulating the heat that you need. So what the dynamic does is it moves quicker. It's, there's three options of Hertz here. 
five, 10 and 15 Hertz. So there's a big difference, 15 pulses per second for the 15 Hertz. So much quicker, but it's using much lower energy. So uh, to compare when you're in, if you're doing me, who's a skin type two, to do static, you may be at 20 joules on me, where dynamic, you would only be at like nine joules on me. You still are going to get to my end point. It's just an accumulation over a period of time. So there's the timer. And we have amazing cheat sheets that all you have to do is read the cheat sheet, plug in the numbers for the skin type, for the hair color, for the hair thickness, and it just tells you what to do. So what you're doing is you're putting how many pulses you want, how much energy, and it will give you the time that you need in whatever hurt hurts you um, have chosen. So for example, let's say it says I'm nine joules. Okay, I set it to nine joules. And then I want to do 15 hertz. Okay, I choose 15. And then um, it will tell me to do 400 pulses. So I'll set it to 400 pulses. And then let's say it will tell me 40 seconds. So it times it out for you. So as soon as you start in that one square, all you do is go back and forth somewhat quickly. So, you know, they're, they're not feeling too much heat, but you're just slowly building heat in that area. And it's going to count down 400 pulses and, and that 40 seconds, I'm just making up numbers, but 400 pulses in that 40 seconds generating heat, then the timer will go off. So it's really kind of the same concept where static mode is going in with higher energy and just blasting the hair follicle, coagulating the root of the hair bulb where dynamic mode is doing the same thing. It's just not blasting it. It's just slowly building heat, building heat, building heat, building heat, and then building enough heat that we get it to coagulate. It, it, it does take a little bit more time to do dy dynamic though, um, but it's important to have the dynamic mode because a few reasons. One, some people just like the painting technique. They enjoy, they enjoy it. Um, but moreover, much, much moreover, is the fact of their skin type. Just think of that 22 joules, like I was saying, compared to nine in a slower accumulation of heat, it's so safe for your skin type fours, fives, and sixes. Um, so you, you have to use it on those darker skin types, especially fives and sixes. Um, and then additionally for comfort, if you have a male who, I mean, we know males are not the best at uh, their pain tolerance and they're getting their full back done, it may be spicy, especially if they have really dark, really coarse, really dense hair, it can be spicy. So you can start out slowly on them. For their first couple treatments, you can do dynamic where you're just slowly building up the heat, easy breezy, no pain at all. Then by the third time they come back, the hair has been, I mean, reduced like crazy. It's no longer super dark and coarse and dense. You can move it to static and now they're comfortable. Um, and they're kind of used to getting treatments at this point. So they'll be more tolerant to it. So dynamic, it has the option of um, five Hertz, 10 Hertz and 15 Hertz. The cheat sheet will let you know which Hertz to choose for based on like what you're treating, the skin type. Um, and just know you're moving a little slower in five Hertz and you're just moving quicker with 15 Hertz. It really only takes a couple treatments to really get the feel for how quickly you should move and not um, creating too much heat in one area if you're moving too slowly. Okay, um, now we'll talk about pulse duration. So pulsation, this is going to what I was talking about earlier, which is the thermal relaxation time. And pulsation is um, taking energy and delivering it at a certain speed. The beauty of the Elysian, you don't have to choose your pulsation. We know with years of R&D and research and knowing what skin type they are, what hair color it is, what thickness it is, what pulse duration they will need. So you don't have to adjust this. It's, it's already preset for you when you set your other parameters. Um, but understanding pulse duration is still important. So it's, it's the speed in which you're delivering the energy. So there's a big difference in delivering the energy very quickly or very slowly. So you'll notice that your pulse duration will be shorter when you have put in that they have a lighter skin type, lighter hair and thinner. Reason being is those hair follicles cool quickly. So you need to take the energy and deliver it 
fast and get the energy into the hair follicle before it can cool, because that's what we want. We want to build up enough heat where we destroy the hair follicle. So if it cools fast, then we need to be fast in delivering that heat. On the opposite end, if you put in that they are um, darker hair and denser and thicker, then you'll get a pulse duration that's longer because all of that hair holds onto heat for much longer because it's dark. There's a lot of chromophore, there's a lot of pigment in the area. So it will trap in heat and it will hold in heat. Um, so it doesn't cool quickly. So we wanna put it in slowly and not too quickly because if we put it in too fast, all of those hair follicles, because it's dense, dark, coarse hair, will absorb the light too fast and will end up really targeting the skin around it and, and creating blisters. So it's going to be a much shorter, I'm sorry, much longer, slower pulse duration in the skin uh, or in the hair when, um, when it's dark and dense and coarse and thick. Um, I always give analogies on this. So a quick one, we have a large stock pot of water and a small pan of water, and we put them both to a rapid boil and we turn them off and we come back to them an hour later, which one's still gonna be hot? It's most likely gonna be, or not most likely, I don't know why I said that, it's going to be the large stock pot of water. Um, why is it still hot? Just because there's more liquid in it. That's it, there's more water, there's just more more concentration, where the small pan of water, when we come back to it a couple hours later, is going to be room temperature, if not cool at this point. So think of that, that's the TRT, the thermal relaxation time. How long does your target hold on to heat for? A very light, um, thin hair follicle is that small pan of water. It cools fast. Your, um, your dark, dense, coarse hair is your large stock pot of water. It holds on to heat and it attracts heat very easily. So you will be using a longer pulse duration for that and a much shorter pulse duration for your lighter, um, lighter, thinner hairs. You don't have to worry about this though. It's preset, which is great. Okay, um, pulse shape, pulse structure. This is the way the engineers have developed the handpiece and how, um, how the uh, laser recharges and then releases energy. So back in the day in the 90s when lasers first came out, they almost all were a um, free discharge peak of uh, energy. That, that's, that was what the first generation was. It's that photo that you're seeing there, it's that high peak. It just wasn't controlled. So with it not being controlled, there was this big spike of energy, which was creating that really hot rubber band snap. It could also create adverse burns that we weren't expecting, right? We don't want those burns because just because it wasn't controlled. Um, also, there was tails of energy that was lost. So the engineers have made this a square smooth pulse shape where we don't have the tails of lost energy and it's very controlled. It's very, very steady, steady release of energy. So we're not getting that super hot rubber band snap. I mean, you'll still feel the heat for sure, but nothing like it was back in the day in the first generation. And additionally, we're not getting those um, accidental side effects like burns. Uh, okay, I taught, I spoke about the repetition rate already, uh, but static mode, just as a review, one, two, and three hertz, uh, dynamic mode, five, 10, and 15 hertz. I'm not gonna spend much, there are a few pages I'm gonna skip through. Um, I just highly recommend that um, you still read over the workbook and read um, through the pages I will skip because we put them in the workbook for a reason, because they're important. Um, but this is one I'm not gonna read through, skin types. What I highly recommend is never guessing somebody's skin type. We have created a Fitzpatrick quiz for you. You can find it on the portal, um, download it, print it, use, use it electronically and have all of your patients fill out the Fitzpatrick uh, quiz. You just never wanna guess because that could sometimes get you into trouble. Um, especially on your darker skin types like um, Asian, Hispanic, Indian, African, because they have so much pigment in their skin, it's more attracted to the laser. You want to be extra safe. So you really want to know what their skin type is. Um, and then we have contact cooling on the Elysian, uh, that sapphire crystal. 
uh, Elysian Crystal Freeze is what we, we named it, Crystal Freeze. And it's a contact cooling that uses 10% um, ethylene glycol antifreeze. So it's antifreeze inside the system. You'll never have to, to fill it with antifreeze. You shouldn't ever have to um, throughout its life. Um, so that's really nice. And it's shipped with the antifreeze. So that's great too. It's just ready to go. Um, and the contact cooling will always be five degrees. So that sap sapphire crystal, when you touch it, will always be five degrees Celsius. So of course it's, it's protecting the um, surface of the skin, the epidermis, but it's also keeping the patients very comfortable. This is one I'm not going to read through. <laughs> Obviously we would be here all, um, all day. Um, but of course, read through it when you are studying. Uh, test procedure is always very important um, on everybody, but especially your darker skin types. You want to test your darker skin types, fours, fives, and sixes, um, and wait for, um, for, I would really say 48 hours after the test procedure because darker skin types have a delayed response to treatments and to heat, you want to make sure that you're safe. So I would say like at a consultation, bring them into the room, do the test procedure in a small area that's not a noticeable area. Don't do the test procedure here. Uh, well, you wouldn't be doing it here anyways because it's hair removal, but you know what I mean. And, um, and wait those 48 hours, bring them back in and just make sure it was safe. Uh, for your lighter skin types, then it's it's just a couple hours. But I would say, even if you're going to do it the, the day of treatment, just take your time testing in an area. Even if you, you don't and you can't wait two to four hours, just be slow with your test procedure. Make sure you're getting their feedback on what their sensation is. It's normal for them to have a light sunburn sensation after the treatment. You don't want them to report back that they have a lot of heat. That's when you back off. So just take your time with testing. Uh, that's really important. But we have created the most amazing cheat sheets to where there's really no guesswork with this system at all. It will tell you exactly what parameters to enter. Test the area. If you get that amazing endpoint, great. You can stay there. Not so much. You feel like you can you could do a little bit better. Go up one jewel and you're usually there, or maybe two jewels and you're there. There's not a lot of wiggle room to what we have created on on the cheat sheet. It's it's usually just a couple jewels that you're increasing and you've hit your endpoint. So make sure to use those those guides. They will be your best friend. Laminate them, pop them on the device, or just have them in the room. Uh, this is another one that I'm not going to read through, but again, it's very important to, to read through it um, uh, when you're studying. Uh, one thing I'll mention is that um, you can use ultrasound gel. Um, well, you want to use ultrasound gel. It's a very thin layer, one millimeter. If they're darker skin type five or six, you can double that up. You can make it thicker and use two millimeters just to help protect the skin. Um, maybe in the future, we will use other things um, like certain types of aloe or certain types of like um, baby oil or, or maybe something that's not like mineral based uh, to where you don't have to wipe off the gel after. It's just something that they can rub in and go to make it even quicker and easier. So uh, we're looking into that for sure, uh, just to make it easier and quicker. I mean, they're in and out the door for full legs already in like 12 minutes. <laughs> I'm that how amazing would that be if they could just okay rub in the baby oil or whatever we're gonna come up with and and they're out the door which is gonna be great uh, just make sure safety uh, glasses lasers can blind you so um, optical density seven that's covering the 810 nanometer wavelength or if you're using the blend handpiece in the future you'll want to make sure it covers those wavelengths as well um, we're cleaning the handpiece with just 70 percent alcohol. Um, and, uh, I think about it. That's all I need to say there. Okay. Uh, again, read through that though. So how are we killing this hair follicle? What are we doing? And, um, it's again, going back to that process of selective photothermolysis, light heat destruction of the hair follicle itself. So what happens is the laser is attracted to the pigment in the hair follicle. The heat then travels deep through the hair shaft 
to the bulb of the hair follicle. And that's when we build up enough heat that we get coagulation and we're actually compromising the stem cells. So the stem cells are compromised and then can't produce um, the melanin or the hair in that area. So that's when we're getting um, hair removal. By the way, any type of light, light based technology, we can't say permanent hair removal, permanent hair reduction, because usually they'll need a maintenance session and a year, two years, sometimes six months. Um, the only thing that's permanent hair removal is electrolysis, um, but that's not really popular nowadays because it takes forever and it's painful. Okay, um, so that's what we're doing to the hair, raising the temperature of the hair bulb, the papilla, um, and the stem cells, we compromise it and it, and it no longer produces the, the pigment um, and, and no longer have the hair in the area. Uh, it's important to treat during a certain um, stage of the hair growth. So we have antigen, catagen, and telogen. Catagen and telogen is when the hair follicle is, is or has come unattached, um, detached, <laughs> detached from the actual living cells, the stem cells. So there's nothing to target at that point. That's just when the hair is shedding. Um, when it's important to treat is during the antigen um, growth phase. And that's when everything's intact and that the stem cells are there and we can really have that, that target that we need. Now you can't look at your legs and go, okay, this one's an antigen, this one, I mean, we don't know. What's important is after you've done the first treatment, how you space it out from there to where we're giving enough time to get, um, most, the most that we can of those hairs back to the antigen phase to then do another treatment. So face is every four weeks and then um, hormonal areas, chin, underarms, bikini is every four to six weeks. It's actually best to wait six weeks. There is more um, hairs in the antigen growth phase at six weeks for those areas. And then back legs and arms is eight to 10 weeks. It takes a little bit longer, the, the growth cycle in, in those areas. 10 weeks, you, you don't really need to wait the 10 weeks. Most of the hair follicles are back to that antigen phase um, at eight weeks. So I would do four weeks base, hormonal areas, six weeks, and then your back legs and arms every eight weeks. Okay, um, not gonna read that. Again, it's, it's gonna be good to study over. Um, okay, what is our endpoint? Our endpoint, it's called perifollicular erythema and edema. What that means is that there's redness and swelling around in each hair follicle. So it actually, you can see it right there. There's little red dots. That's the perfect endpoint that you want. Sometimes, you can't get that perfect endpoint on, on patients. So a secondary endpoint is going to be the smell of burnt hair. Um, and you'll usually get that with anybody that has significant um, hair in the area that's pigmented. Like above the lip, a woman above the lip, you're really not gonna get that burnt hair smell, but most everyone under arms, a man's back, legs, things like that, you'll typically always get the smell of burnt hair, the, the smell of success, right? Um, and these little red dots. Uh, again, if you can't get the red dots, don't worry. Sometimes the red dots are delayed. They'll see them when they get home. Um, so just overall mild uh, lingering heat sensation in the area is normal. Smell of burnt hair is, is totally fine. Uh, your treatment course is going to be about six to eight sessions. I would say most everyone is about six sessions. Um, and then unless you have like a full man's back that's like really dark and dense and coarse and you need to use dynamic in the beginning and you're going to go a little bit slower on them. Not that dynamic is going to be less effective because that's not true. It will be just as effective. Um, you know, maybe you're going to go slower on them. Maybe you're not turning up the energy much. Maybe they're nerve, whatever it may be. Then you can always sell a pack of bait. Um, interval, we spoke about that depending on the anatomic site and then maintenance one session every six months or is required it's typically, it's honestly typically not six months. It's usually longer than that. So I would say for hair removal clients, just have them give you a call when they start to kind of see those hairs sporadically come back uh, to call then for, for a maintenance session. Uh, this is post-treatment care guidelines. I'm not going to fully read through this, but um, if there's a ton of heat, 
just make sure that you know they're using um, cool packs on the area, hydrocortisone cream, silvadine is really good to have in your practice. Uh, the, in, in the times where it's a just in case, right? Like a, ooh, oops, um, it's really good to have. Um, you know, make sure that they're not jumping into a scalding hot bathtub right after, that they're not getting in the sun after. So that's why it's so good for hair removal treatments to be done in the fall and winter uh, because you don't have to worry about them wearing shorts after you've done their legs, but they have to wear a high factor SPF um, 50 plus, and really just try to avoid sun exposure in the area just to be extra safe because it's a laser and it makes the skin more sensitive to the sun. Um, contraindications, uh, I'm not going to fully go through all of these contraindications just time-wise. Um, I do have a webinar on contraindications just across the board for all of our technologies. And, um, and I speak about the ones for hair removal as well. Um, and they're also on the consent form. So definitely watch the contraindication webinar if, if you need a review of that and why. Um, let's see. And I may talk about the IPL hair removal on that contraindication um, webinar, but it's the same thing. Um, like for instance, vitiligo is not on um, the contraindication list for like our radio frequency hand pieces, but it is for our laser and light-based technologies. Why? Because um, these are these devices are attracted to pigment, and if, when they have vitiligo, it can create permanent um, loss of pigment in that area. So there's going to be some contraindications that are a little bit different for for a laser-based technology. But again, I cover that in the contraindication webinar. You you won't miss anything there. Um, okay. Let me just see certain things I want to point out here. Um, Okay, I'm not gonna full, I'm not gonna read over these. Um, what I will say though is what I've been saying is read it because you can see possible side effects. There, um, some of them are a little bit more common, some of them are more rare. Um, but things like changes in pigment, I mean, it could potentially like if someone has some sunspots in the area, it could be targeted to that, and then that could turn brown. That's totally normal. Um, the erythema, that's normal. That's what our endpoint is. It's things like that that will resolve, but it's good to know because uh, when you're talking to your patient in a consultation and letting them know what the risks are, what's normal, what to expect, what they'll see, um, is it, I mean, all of that's really important. So I just highly recommend reading through this. Um, all I would be doing is just reading through it to you and you can do that yourself. Um, if they do suffer from um, like the herpes virus, uh, especially if you're doing hair removal above the lip, you can prescribe them an antiviral such as Valtrex where they're taking, uh, it's typically two grams the day before, two grams the day of. I'm not saying that that's gonna keep the cold sore away. I am saying that there's a much higher um, probability of them being okay and that the cold sore won't come out. Um, it's not a guarantee, but if they really want hair removal done, then okay, they're gonna get it done, better to protect them with an antiviral. Um, same with like shingles, if they have shingle outbreaks on the body, it's, it's gonna be good to get them on an antiviral just in case because heat can bring out um, these types of viruses. All right. Again, just read through this. Okay, you know, I think that's it. So what I'm gonna do, since I have a couple minutes, I, I didn't want to go over an hour on, um, on this webinar, but since I have time, I'm gonna talk about a few things. I don't know if it's on here, but I'll just leave this page up just in case. Um, uh, if somebody has moles in the area, avoid moles. It's just a precautionary of like, if there's any type of cancerous cells in this mole and we're taking heat over it, it's just a precaution. Um, also to protect you as, a, as an owner operator. Um, so avoid moles. And if they have a lot of moles, you can just use a white eyeliner pencil 
and wipe them out because when you wipe them out and you go over them, let's say they have a ton and you just wanna glide in the area, when there's the white eyeliner pencil, the white will just reflect the heat away from the mole. So that's a little trick that you can do. Um, again, white eyeliner pencils are very important for when you're using dynamic mode, but even static mode, even when you're just gliding with static, it's great to make lines to, to really keep yourself straight and in line with what you're doing and not missing areas or not overlapping areas too much. So white eyeliner pencil is an amazing trick. Um, I would always do photo documentation of hair removal. I know that probably seems silly, um, but it's not. I would, I would uh, document that. Um, oh, there was something else with, um, oh, um, one of my coworkers has a great trick that when they have very little hair in the area at the very end of the treatment course, or at their maintenance session, you can actually have them not shave and come in because why, why do a full leg when they only have like 10 hairs left <laughs> um, or at their maintenance session, have them grow it out, have a razor in one hand, the laser in the other. And as you go and you're seeing hairs, just shave and shoot, shave and shoot, shave and shoot. It will save you a lot of time in, in, the, in the long run. Um, I mean, not that it's going to save a ton of time because the <laughs> device is already fast, but it will save you a little time if you want to do it that way. Um, and just remember that uh, usually you're only needing to adjust like one or two jewels to get your endpoint from that cheat sheet. Now, as you go, as you're at like the last session, that may be different. You may need to go up a little bit more than that. But in the beginning, it should be pretty spot on. Um, but of course, you're taking your time to really test. Um, what else do I want to mention? Okay, now since I have time, what I was really going to do, and then I stopped on that page, is I will go through the contraindications since I have the time to do so. Okay. Um, so here's our list. They're also going to be on the consent form. Never, ever, 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 ever treat anybody without a consent form for the safety of them, for the safety of your practice and uh, lawsuit. So um, just always remember that you can never treat anybody without a consent form, even your employees. Okay, so exposure to sun or artificial tanning during the past three to four weeks prior to treatment. So sun, especially two to four weeks. I would wait four weeks just to be extra safe. Um, artificial tanning, uh, it was same thing if it's like a tanning bed, but spray tan, uh, it's um, a week to two weeks. Unfortunately, spray tans don't last all that long. They do last longer on the body than they do the face. So I would say on the body, wait two weeks, but usually spray tan won't last after two weeks. Uh, I wish it did. So two week wait period. If they come in, it's been two weeks and you see like a little residual spray tan, you could take alcohol and gauze and scrub the area and the rest of the spray tan will come right off and then you're safe to treat. Um, pregnancy, no, just <laughs> we're never ever treating anybody that's pregnant. There's never want that risk. Um, if they're breastfeeding, it's best to wait uh, three months post delivery. And um, actually, do I have that on here? The time? No, but it will be on your consent form. So you can wait three to six months post delivery and three months post breastfeeding. The reason for that is this crazy hormone fluctuation that women are going through um, postpartum. And the, because of the hormones, we really can't promise a, a great outcome. So just make sure to wait. Just, I mean, they're spending, you know, money for this. So why not wait and, and know that you're going to get the optimal result. Uh, use of photosensitive medications. There's a lot out there. So if they don't know, have them bring it in. You can look it up and see if it's photosensitive. You can email the clinical department and ask us. Um, but it's too, they would need to get the, off of those two weeks prior. That is very important. Um, because it's making the skin much more sensitive to this light-based technology. Uh, current or history, uh, yeah, current or history of cancer. So this is a very gray area. Um, us as a manufacturer, we have to say like, no, 
no history of cancer can you treat, but it's gray. Most medical directors will say, you know, someone had breast cancer I don't know, 10 years ago, <laughs> they're in remission. Can they get hair removal on their legs? Yes. Um, no big deal, but I would be very careful with any type of skin cancers in the area. I wouldn't treat that, but I would highly recommend getting a note from their oncologist, just clearing them. Uh, cause it's just that extra precaution for you. Uh, use of oral, um, Accutane eek, that makes the skin very thin, very fragile, very, 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 I was on it twice in my life. I can attest to that. I would scratch myself and bleed. It's not good. So three to six months, I would wait six months post Accutane. Um, epilepsy is a risk because of the light, um, heart pacemaker defibrillator or any type of implanted electrical device because we can cause theirs to malfunction. Uh, so that is not a good one. Uh, immunosuppressive diseases and uh, immunosuppressive uh, medications, uh, things like, um, um, well, HIV, but like lupus. Lupus, we can create a flare up. Uh, with the heat. So that's why that's really contraindicated. There's a lot of practices that will still treat patients with lupus. They just know that there's that risk associated with, uh, with autoimmune. Um, fragile or very dry skin, hormonal disorders, we spoke about that, um, or endocrine disorders such as diabetes. Uh, there is a, a much bigger risk to uh, type 1 diabetics because of the healing process. Um, Type two, I would say fine, as long as it's controlled, you don't have that huge risk like a type one diabetic, but there's a very low percentage of type one diabetic too. So, um, so that's good. Um, but hormonal disorders, that's a big one where you cannot promise outcomes. If they have hormonal hair here and they have not seen an endocrinologist or they're not getting hormone replacement therapy or getting their hormones checked or on medications that you know they're balanced, you could do hair removal all day long on them and it's not going away. So just make sure they know that, that if you're going to go in and, and treat the hormonal hair, that they also should be seeing a physician to get their hormones under control. Um, history of bleeding or uh, excess bruising um, issues are anticoagulant. So if they're on blood thinners such as um, Coumadin and they can't get off, then there is a slight risk to that. Um, but if they're on, um, oops, someone, someone's just coming onto the webinar, they're gonna be very disappointed. Um, but if they uh, are on blood thinners like fish oil, ginseng, ginkgo, uh, um, uh, aspirin, things like that, that they can get off, have them pop off a week beforehand just to be safe. There's not a huge risk for hair removal, but there's still a risk because we're still using light, laser, and heat. Um, diseases which may be stimulated by light. I actually spoke about that. Um, history of keloid scars. Nobody with the history of keloid scars. I did a webinar on keloid scars. I highly recommend watching it. A lot of people think they keloid, but it's just hypertrophic scars. Hypertrophic is fine. Keloid is not. A keloid can come out years later, months later, and it can happen because of a burn, but it can also just happen from overall heat. So you're taking a major risk if someone truly keloids, so I would be very careful with that. Now, if it's just hypertrophic, that's okay. But any type of impaired wound healing, of course, we're using heat-based treatment. We, we need the body to have the ability to heal. Um, hepatitis or liver disease, same thing, excess bleeding, bruising, um, lack of healing ability. So um, just the health of the overall uh, patient in, in terms of healing, uh, that, that is a, a big risk. And vitiligo, I spoke about. Um, okay, undiagnosed lesions, of course, make sure to get those checked before you do the treatment any active infection in the treatment area, you'll avoid not doing the treatment, uh, unknown inflammation, or maybe, you know, they're inflamed from like a sunburn, something like that. No, um, you'll need to wait. Tattoos, be very careful. If they have a huge tattoo and they want hair removal around it, you cannot go over a tattoo because the metal and the ink will pull that laser light in it will create blisters and burns and destroy their tattoo and can create scarring on them. It's horrible. Um, I've seen it, you know, happen within the industry. 
Um, but if they have a huge tattoo and they want hair, hair removal around the tattoo, you can take white gauze and white medical tape and tape it, put the white gauze down and then tape it around with white medical tape to be extra safe. Um, if they just have a small tattoo and you just wanna avoid it, that's okay, but you have to keep a safe distance. Uh, uh, safe distance by about that much because light scatters. And so that tattoo will want to pull the light naturally. So it's actually best just to always tape down a tattoo um, just for extra safety. And then here's a list of um, like, if you're going to treat the face, upper lip, um, hormonal, chin hair, uh, a man's lower face, so he doesn't want to shave anymore, whatever it may be. Here's a list of things that they may have gotten done, like a peel or that they're on retin-A or they've had um, some type of like laser procedure. Here is the waiting period for all of those. I won't read them all out, but they're in the workbook for you just to review and make sure that you just have that, that waiting period. Um, okay. Well, I think that is going to be it. I stopped, I'm right at one hour, <laughs> yay. Um, but yeah, I hope that you love your Elysian. I'm sure that you do. Um, I'm sure that you're just gonna absolutely love two things. One, the speed in which it does the treatments and that your patients are happy because they're in and out the door for full legs and 15 minutes with prep and everything. Um, but the, your revenue is so big with this device because of how fast treatments are. And, um, you know, sometimes hair removal, ROI, it can be challenging because it's oversaturated in the market. Uh, so because we're not charging as much as we did, like back in the 1990s for hair removal when it first came out and it was a fortune, because we can't charge that nowadays, um, then you really do need a fast system, right? To, to make sure that you're not in there for a long period of time during the treatment. Uh, and the fact that you can you know, do these large, large areas in less than a half hour and make the money quickly is amazing. So we really hope that you're enjoying it and that you do um, end up loving it uh, as much as we do. All right, you guys, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, you joining. And of course, if you have any clinical questions, you can always email us at the email that I showed earlier in the webinar um, or you know, give us a call if you're not a big emailer. Our number is 888-415-1192. Our clinical email um, address is clinicalusa at sinclair.com. Uh, and if you have a technical question, which you shouldn't with the Elysian, which is amazing, but if you do, you can always email customer care usa at sinclair.com as well. All right, thank you so much. Bye-bye.